Bonsoir à toutes et à tous. Bienvenue aujourd'hui à notre nouveau Meetup. Nous avons le plaisir de collaborer avec la communauté Airless 10 Strasbourg dans l'organisation d'une watch party. C'est une première pour nous, la première watch party francophone qui sera dédiée à la conférence qui a été récemment organisée à Chicago et a été organisée par COSIT. Je vais brièvement introduire la communauté Early 10. Uh, Early 10 uh, Paris a été fondée en 2016. Uh, C'est un réseau local uh, affilié à l'organisation mondiale uh, sans but lucratif Early 10 et Blanc, qui compte aujourd'hui uh, plus de 29 réseaux, uh, l'écho dans plus de 65 uh, pays partout dans le monde. Euh, le réseau Early 10 a été créé dans le, bout, le, dans le but pardon, de promouvoir euh, le logiciel R et euh, une représentation équilibrée euh, des genres au sein de la communauté. Euh, voilà, on encourage la participation euh, diversifiée des utilisateurs. Euh, Shaima Bouranmi, qui est aujourd'hui parmi nous, et moi-même, euh, gérant aujourd'hui l'organisation de Early 10 Paris. Euh, N'hésitez pas à scanner le QR code, il nous s'ouvre sur les réseaux euh, sociaux. Euh, finalement, euh, nous sommes ravis d'annoncer notre prochain meetup euh, qui sera organisé en présentiel à Paris euh, dans les locaux de Datacraft le 19 octobre euh, prochain, euh, où nous aurons l'occasion euh, d'accueillir euh, Kim Antunes et euh, Anna Doisy euh, qui vont faire des, partager avec nous, faire des retours d'expérience euh, respectives en sciences de données et en consultation euh, scientifique. Je te passe la parole, Rita. Oui, merci. Et Arlé di Strasbourg, c'est le même concept d'Arlé di Paris. On est parti tout, de, tout le monde d'Arlé di Global. Euh, nous, on était fondés dans le 2017. Et, et Nancy, qui est avec nous, et elle est aussi co-organisatrice avec moi d'Air Lady Strasbourg. Merci, Rita. Okay. Euh, je vais euh, passer à, la, à mon retour d'expérience parce que j'ai eu le plaisir de participer euh, récemment à la conférence à Chicago. Je vais partager mon écran. J'espère que c'est bon pour vous. Alors, je vais présenter brièvement avec vous mon expérience euh, en tant que participante, en étant que teacher assistant. Et euh, c'était grâce à la bourse offerte par Posit que j'ai pu y assister. Et euh, je serai toujours reconnaissante envers cette opportunité. Généralement, les conférences de Posit sont organisées aux États-Unis. Euh, cette année, la conférence s'est déroulée sur quatre jours, euh, dans deux jours euh, dédiés aux ateliers de formation. Euh, certains ateliers se sont étendus sur deux journées euh, avec des pauses, tandis que d'autres se sont déroulés plutôt sur une seule journée. Euh, je suis arrivée à Chicago le samedi soir, euh, la veille de la première journée de la conférence. Euh, J'ai eu l'occasion de rencontrer en personne euh, des membres de la communauté avec lesquels je collabore depuis longtemps en ligne sur divers sujets, et bien évidemment visant à servir la communauté R. Et euh, voilà, j'étais extrêmement heureuse de pouvoir enfin les rencontrer en personne et de, de passer euh, plutôt du temps ensemble cette nuit-là. La conférence s'est déroulée dans un grand hôtel à Chicago qui était euh, vraiment impressionnant. Et lors de l'enregistrement, j'ai récupéré euh, mon badge ainsi qu'un ensemble de pins euh, que certains d'entre nous avaient collé euh, sur le badge. Ce que j'ai apprécié le plus, c'était euh, le livre qui contenait de nombreuses euh, cheat sheets euh, relatives au langage de programmation R. Euh, qu'on avait récupéré à la réception. Comme vous pouvez le constater, il y avait des sites sur, euh, sur pas mal de packages, deployer, etupilate, et etc. Du coup, Shaima va, va partager le lien euh, avec vous dans le chat dans quelques instants. Euh, le, le lien vers le site. Euh, durant la première journée, euh, j'ai participé à un atelier, de, un atelier de formation, pourtant sur le développement des, euh, des workflows en data science avec R. Cet atelier était animé par Ryan Johnson, euh, qui était conseiller, qui est conseiller en data science chez Posit, et euh, Cathy Masolo, Solutions Engineer chez Posit. Au cours de cette session, euh, j'ai acquis euh, des compétences plutôt pour euh, explorer plus, plus efficacement les données, euh, manipuler des bases de données, euh, mais aussi déployer des données en utilisant à la fois des outils open source. Et, mais aussi, il y avait des outils professionnels proposés par Posit Composite Connect, etc. 
J'ai beaucoup apprécié plusieurs aspects de l'organisation des ateliers. Euh, notamment, l'un d'entre eux était plutôt l'utilisation des sticky notes euh, de couleurs que nous pouvons coller sur notre ordinateur en bas en cas de besoin d'assistance. Euh, et du coup, du plus, j'ai également apprécié euh, que les instructeurs nous aient encouragés à prendre euh, trois minutes pour faire connaissance avec la personne euh, qui était assise à côté de nous, ce qui a euh, contribué à améliorer la communication tout au long de l'atelier. À la fin de la journée, une réception dédiée au livre a été organisée. Et j'ai eu l'opportunité de recevoir une dédicace spéciale des auteurs de la deuxième édition du livre « Art for Data Science euh, ». Julia Sig était également présente avec son livre « Text Mining with Art ». Et euh, il y avait euh, pas mal, il y avait de nombreux autres livres extraordinaires et qui étaient offerts pour poser. Du coup, j'ai fait la queue et j'ai eu l'occasion de rencontrer Hadley Wickham et Miné euh, Sittinkaya Randall et c'était euh, juste incroyable. Durant la deuxième journée, euh, des ateliers, j'ai commencé ma, ma journée avec euh, prenant un petit déj, voilà, avec Billy Koussi qui est de la communauté Air Ladies Abuja et Tianga de la communauté Air Ladies Colombo. La deuxième journée de la conférence était également euh, consacrée aux ateliers de formation et ce jour-là, j'ai participé en tant que teacher assistant euh, aux côtés de euh, Gary euh, Groleman et Stephanie Hazlitt. Cet atelier était animé par Emma Rand et Ian Little. Il portait sur la transition d'un utilisateur R classique à une personne euh, qui est vraiment capable de programmer euh, efficacement avec R. J'ai vraiment apprécié euh, cette expérience, d'autant plus que c'était euh, ma première participation à une grande conférence comme celle-ci. J'ai aimé pouvoir euh, voilà, aider les participants, les débloquer, les accompagner dans la résolution des pratiques. Et euh, voilà, je suis certaine que je souhaiterais revivre une telle expérience euh, à l'avenir. Durant la, la soirée, un Shiny Gathering a été organisé par Absilon, euh, qui est une entreprise proposant des services en Shiny, euh, dans un café très sympathique. Durant cette soirée, nous étions en équipe pour participer à un trivia game et, voilà, qui, cons qui consiste à répondre à des questions euh, sur Shiny. Et nous avons euh, passé vraiment de bons moments ensemble. La troisième journée était consacrée aux keynotes et aux présentations, euh, qu'elles soient courtes ou longues. J'ai commencé ma, ma journée en participant à un Birds of Feather Coffee Meetup, euh, qui est plutôt une rencontre informelle entre les membres du réseau Early 10. Euh, J'étais euh, entourée de personnes euh, qui vraiment partagent ma passion pour la communauté Early 10. Et euh, nous avons commencé à discuter, socialiser autour d'une table. Il y avait également d'autres euh, genres de ce de ce type de Birds of Feather, Café Meetup, où euh, des développeurs Shiny se sont réunis, ou même des développeurs de package. L'ouverture de la Posit Conf a été tout simplement aussi incroyable parce qu'en fait, ils ont diffusé une vidéo dans laquelle euh, John Paul, qui est technicien de terrain en matière de qualité de l'eau à la réserve de l'île indienne de Penoboscot, euh, parlait de la façon dont la tribu utiliser la rivière comme sa propre autoroute et comment elle la considérait comme sa parente, sa sœur, euh, ce qui donnait vraiment la vie. Dans la vidéo, il disait que c'est vraiment euh, dommage de voir comment quelqu'un que vous aimez être, soit pollué, non pas par un choix, mais plutôt simplement à cause de l'air qu'il respire ou de quelqu'un qui déverse quelque chose dans votre eau. L'idée là, c'était que Jean-Paul a expliqué comment il utilisait des technologies open source euh, tels que Air, Air Studio, pour préserver la santé de la rivière et, ses, et de ses habitants. Euh, du coup, voilà, entendre cette histoire inspirante et savoir euh, que nous participons à une conférence qui promeut de telles valeurs a été vraiment une source d'inspiration incroyable. Et aussi, mais aussi, participer à une conférence euh, qui soit axé sur l'inclusion et la diversité était également quelque chose d'impressionnant. Au cours de la conférence, plusieurs moments de rassemblement social ont eu lieu, euh, qui, ont bu, qui ont bu but plutôt pour favoriser euh, les discussions ouvertes et constructives, euh, ce qui a grandement contribué à briser les barrières. Toute la, jo la journée, le linge était aussi ouvert, offrant l'opportunité de s'engager dans des discussions avec les personnes euh, travaillant chez Posit ainsi euh, vraiment que d'autres euh, professionnels. Les échanges se poursuivaient également euh, activement sur, sur la plateforme Discord parce qu'il a été possible de, de, de s'inscrire à la conférence virtuellement, euh, ce qui permettrait aux personnes participant virtuellement à la conférence de s'impliquer pleinement dans, dans des discussions. 
Pendant cette journée, un déjeuner a été organisé spécialement pour les personnes ayant bénéficié de l'Opportunity Scholarship euh, et nous avons eu l'occasion d'exprimer euh, notre gratitude de partager comment nous contribuons à faire euh, une différence au sein de la communauté en participant à, à son expansion. Euh, et finalement, Air Lady Chicago et Air Lady Global ont collaboré pour organiser une rencontre à Air Lady à la fin de la pause de camp. Et cet événement était ouvert au public. Les participants à la post et même les membres qui n'ont pas, n'étaient pas inscrits pouvaient assister. Et c'était une belle occasion de voir à quel point les Air Lady sont formidables. Et malheureusement, j'ai dû manquer cette rencontre car j'avais mon vol de retour à Paris. Uh, Riva, um, aussi que regarda de Air Ladies Global Team, a donné une excellente présentation et a discuté de la façon dont Air Ladies Global um, envisage le développement de Air Ladies dans la, pour la prochaine décennie, ainsi que les efforts déployés pour élargir la communauté Air Ladies. Il a été également annoncé par Hadley Wickham que la prochaine uh, conférence aura lieu à Seattle. Finalement, je tiens à dire que cette expérience uh, a été uh, extrêmement enrichissante. Euh, pour moi, tant, que, tant sur le plan professionnel que personnel, je pense que Posit a réussi à fournir un environnement euh, plutôt convivial euh, où les participants ont pu se connecter, à discuter, à partager des idées. Et euh, bien évidemment, cela a grandement euh, encouragé le renforcement de la communauté, ce qui est important, euh, ce qui peut conduire à de nouveaux partenariats et des projets euh, collaboratifs. Et voilà, vive l'open source, vive la communauté R et qui sait bientôt à Seattle. Merci beaucoup pour votre C'est intéressant. <rire> Merci beaucoup. Super, Mona. C'était très réjouissant ouais. ta présentation. Super, on est ravis. Mm-hmm. Et, on, et je suis un peu jaloux que je n'étais pas là. <rire> Mais oui, c'est, c'est, c'est jaloux. Hein. Tu vas oh. l'année prochaine, il n'est jamais trop tard. Ah non, non, bien sûr, bien sûr. L'année prochaine... Ouais. On va tout à Seattle. <rire> Ça me va. <rire> Je ne sais pas si quelqu'un a une question. N'hésitez pas à désactiver votre micro si vous voulez me demander. La prochaine fois, Sylviane, ne, ne t'en fais pas. Ouais. Moi, j'ai petite, euh, peut-être une petite question. Je n'ai pas compris le teacher assistant. C'était quoi, en fait en fait, ouais, en fait, il y a des personnes, il y a les instructeurs, c'est, c'est eux qui ont créé le, le cours, la formation, le support de formation. Après, il y a des personnes, teacher assistant, j'étais avec deux autres et qui, l'idée, c'est de, de répondre aux questions parce que, que parfois, il y a des gens qui ont rencontré des problèmes, je ne sais pas, pour installer une librairie, pour faire les exercices pr- pratiques. Et tu es là pour, pour se diriger vers eux. Tu, 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 tu les aides, en fait. Très bien. C'est ça. Euh... OK, je vois qu'il n'y a pas de questions. Je pense que je peux passer à... Je peux repartager mon écran pour diffuser le premier talk euh, qui a été délivré par Tom sur GitHub Copilot. Alors, je vais partager. Je vais m'assurer que... Vous avez le sein. Oui, c'est ça. Super, merci. Super. Alors, je vais agrandir le point. Et... All right, my name is Tom Mock. I'm the product manager for our studio in Posit Workbench. There's been a lot of talk about Posit Workbench today, so that's been great. Uh, I'm here with uh, basically a one-slide presentation, which is GitHub Copilot is available in our studio, and it's finally here. So. Okay, so we have a couple more slides because we'll want to talk about it, but this talk officially closes issue 10148. Can we have GitHub Copilot integration with our studio, which is by far the most requested feature of all time in our studio with about 519 upvotes. But we don't want to stop there in terms of just because it's available doesn't mean it's the most useful uh, tool or you need to know how to use it to get the most out of it. So that's what I'll spend today talking about. To really understand what Copilot is, I first want to just briefly mention the idea of generative AI, which is a tool that's designed to create novel or new content, right? So uh, it's been trained to identify patterns and then generate new outcomes based upon them. 
For today's talk, I was playing around with Midjourney, which is another uh, tool with generative AI for creating images. And so I created my own little co-pilot here, uh, my dog Howard, who's always with me as I'm programming in my home. And you can see the prompt I used was actually about 15 words or so. And it came out with this remarkably novel output in terms of an image that's fairly complex. I could not probably describe this image in 15 words, but I was able to create this image in 15 words. So Copilot is a tool with generative AI to do similar things, but with code. So Copilot is kind of autocomplete style suggestions as ghost text available inside our studio. Now, I want to differentiate a little bit here, though. You already have autocomplete available inside our studio, right? So you have autocomplete that will parse the code and the environment. And importantly, it's supplying possible completions, right? It has to have some text, and it's finishing the word for you. So this is a static set of completions and a little pop-up. And it's provided from your IDE, from your local disk or your local environment. So Copilot can also provide autocomplete style suggestions as ghost text, and I'll show that in a second. But let's differentiate a little bit here. So Copilot, yes, it'll parse the code, it'll parse the environment, but it also has billions of examples of code in the training data of how other people have approached coding problems. So it can supply likely completions. They don't even have to be possible or present in your environment, but the likely completion of it. And these uh, dynamic set of completions it's providing are available via ghost text. So it's not just that one little snippet you're completing, but it could be a multi-line or an entire function that you're defining. And importantly, it is a generative AI tool and it's provided via an API endpoint that you're querying and getting back into your IDE. So let's do this visually. We like graphics, we like images. So here's autocomplete inside our studio. I'm autocompleting the word mean, and I have a couple different variations of mean that I can complete here. Great, this works fantastic in our studio. But if you notice, I have a comment earlier in my script saying, take the mean of the MPG column in MP MT cars data set. I've already said what I want to do, so why don't I just get the average of the MT cars data set MPG column? So here, Copilot is providing ghost text completion, and it's actually parsing that comment and doing a prediction of what it thinks I want to get out of this. So my intent has been codified into a comment, which is then reflected in an output. But we can go a lot farther than that. Maybe I want to do a group by summarize. So I can have a comment saying, calculate the average fuel, fuel efficiency of cars grouped by cylinder and load dplyr. So now I have context that includes the comment and that I've loaded a library. Let's use that library to do something. I get copilot generated ghost text that's multiple lines, not just one word. And importantly, this ghost text doesn't exist in the IDE yet. It's just a UI element, and I can choose to accept it. If I don't like that output, eh, I'll back it out and try again, add some more context, go forward. So you can be really powerful with this. You can codify more of your intent into the document and be more productive. And we'll go into some more advanced examples, but I've only been using screenshots and I at least want to show one little video of what this looks like in practice. It's gonna be fast, but just we'll watch it together. I'm speeding up my development process here. Three lines, a function I made, mode, it's very simple, but I can move forward with it and use it almost immediately. And it's really at the speed of auto-completion. So again, I provided a little bit of context in the script. I provided a scoped and specific prompt, which is return a function to calculate the mode of a vector. It defines a multi-line function for me. I can use that, and then I can immediately use it in my script. I also want to call out the three, the status of the request at the bottom of the IDE saying, Copilot is communicating, or it's finished sending me back a response. So we're going to build off this idea of, sure, it can generate ghost text, it can be single line, multi-line, and we'll go into a bit more of a complicated example. If you want to get started with Copilot in our studio, importantly, you do have to have a subscription to Copilot. So you can go to GitHub, get a personal subscription, or you can get it through your enterprise for business. In the upcoming release of our studio and workbench, uh, which we're expecting in September, uh, you'll be able to enable this within the IDE, or you can try it in the dailies that are available right now. So you go to Tools, Global Options, Copilot tab, you go to Sign In, it takes you to a prompt, you sign into GitHub, and then you're signed in as a user. In this case, I'm J. Thomas Mock on GitHub. I'm signed in and can use Copilot. Now that I've got Copilot available in my IDE and I want to get you know, started, I think the most important thing you can do with any brand new tool is play around with it. Don't just use something basic. 
don't necessarily try to use it in production, but play around with something and try and break it, try and see where it works for you and where it doesn't. I like a game called Keyword. This is something my family started playing. It's similar to like Wordle, but it's like a mini crossword puzzle that um, you can play on your phone and we can do it as a family. It looks a little bit like this. So a miniature crossword, but there's no hints. All you're trying to do is fill the word across horizontally. And in this case, the word is felony and the horizontal uh, word is felony. And then each of those letters spell a different word. So how can we solve the keyword game? I can sit there, I can try and figure out what the letters are, or because I'm doing a conference talk, I can say, let's try and solve this with R, our studio, and Copilot and see how far we can get. And that's exactly what I did. I played around with it, went through for about an hour, prompting, trying to see how far Copilot could take me with me doing as minimal coding as possible. Now to do this, I had to get the most out of the generative loop, and I want y'all to also get the most out of the generative loop, right? Like Copilot is just a generative AI tool. It doesn't have intelligence. It doesn't really know anything. It's just a prediction engine. So the more context and the more of our intent we can write down, the better predictions it's going to give us. That context is like what prompts have been provided, what source code is there, um, what packages are loaded, what's in your environment, kind of all this metadata that you can provide which is quite different than the intent, which is what I actually want to do. So again, I'm trying to codify my intent into a prompt that I can get a response back from. And then there's the output that Copilot actually returns, which hopefully is close to my intent, which was provided by the context. So in this case, I'm gonna show you a few ways to do better context to get you closer to what you actually wanna do with your intent and get overall a better output. And my little buzzword for what we'll use for today is called S2C for simple, specific, and use comments. And I mean use comments throughout. Inline, big comments all over the place and simplify and break up your problems into specific parts. So again, we're trying to solve keyword, which is a pretty open-ended problem to solve with a programming language. So we wanna break down the task, give it an overall structure, what are we gonna do moving forward? I know how to play keyword, but now I have to teach Copilot or teach R to play Copilot. Although I know other people have solved games like Wordle with R already, so I know it's possible. I routed a bunch of comments. I'm not trying to get code back yet. I'm just writing down for both myself and for Copilot as a prompt. What am I trying to do? I'm trying to solve the keyword game. I talk about how to play the game and provide a little bit of context. Again, this is not really talking anything about R. This is just background, right? I'm, I'm not saying write this function, but we're going to create a function ultimately. So I take that context and then I move down in my script and start adding a little bit more. Again, I wanna break down this complex task of solve keyword into something more simple. The simplest method is to not cheat, but be clever. So I know that this is a web portal. It is a JSON API that's available. So I can get the JSON blob from behind the scenes. And I can get the answer from that. So Copilot has solved it and we're done for the day. The answer is staple for August 9th. But that's cheating, and I don't really want to cheat. I want to show you how cool Copilot is inside our studio. So what else is in there? We actually have the words or the hints that are provided. So that's something unique. I can provide those hints to our, to our studio, to Copilot, and we can move forward and try and solve each of the individual words to make up the larger word. And if I fill in those with staple, I get C, chant, bear, spur, really scale. So we kind of know where we're trying to go with this simpler problem as we move forward. So we're just gonna get the hint words, breaking down the, into the component parts and working with those. Now I've provided a little bit longer prompt. So six lines of comments, and then I say, I'm basically trying to get that URL for any specific date, right? I don't wanna have to manually type in the date. I can do like today's date, sys date. And here, I'm getting a function back that takes the date, glues it together, returns me a URL that I can use to get these uh, hints every single time. So then I can move forward with using those outputs and those words moving forward. So now that I've got the, the hint words, I can you know, save those into an object and then I get them back out and be like, all right, now I can actually start working with these hints in R and I'm not cheating anymore, I'm programming. Now, while that was a lot of comments, I can also do expressive names. So if I have comments and say, oh, well, this is what I'm actually trying to do and name it, so the variable, the function, the objects I'm working with, this will help provide additional context about what I'm trying to do. So here I only have two comments and I start typing regex and it returns back a regex from the input word. In this case, replacing any underscore 
with a AZ match, so to replace it with any lowercase letter. Again, I've provided only minimal comments, and I'm just starting to use more exp uh, expressive names to go along with those comments and getting back a nice output of what I actually want. And then I can apply that regex from Word. So I can say, oh, well, given that, let's do matched words. No comments, but just by using what are the matched words as the expressive name, now it's saying, oh, well, we'll, we'll subset, limit the words in, get the regex, apply those together, and these are the words from my little database of words I have locally that are four units long and could possibly match what's your missing letters. But no comments, just by using expressive names and the additional context from within the document. And again, we can get a little bit longer, and by saying I want the top words and doing a little bit more comments, now we have about 12 or 15 lines, I think, of code that it's generating. A longer function that's using that matched words we used previously, uh, applying it, splitting it out into characters, scoring the letters to say, oh, these letters are higher value, uh, setting those to the names, sorting it, and then putting out the top. So I'm not really worried about what the code is. It's functional, it's working, but I'm just trying to see, okay, how far can we get? I've got a lot of momentum going forward. I'm really excited, let's keep going. And then without any comments, I can say, well, give me just the letters from the blank. And it gives me a five line function to get that out. So again, as you build up your script and as you add more context into Copilot, it will give you a better content out so you get a better output. Ultimately, rather than showing you how to solve keyword, we did eventually get to keyword, so I can say from September 9th, a month after I started trying to do this, um, I can get the keyword as one of the following words, recipe or repipe. And as much as I love pipes as a Tidyverse user, I don't really know if repipe is a word, um, so I'm gonna go with its recipes, which is a wonderful Tidy Models package, and we'll accept that. So there you go, Max Kuhn. Ultimately, I want to show you a couple things that you can look at after the fact. There's a gist with the full um, transcript of me prompting, trying to say, do this, do that, give me this, get back, and you can look at it. It's a couple hundred lines of me exploring. And then the keyword function, if you really are interested and want to impress your family and solve keyword in about two seconds every single day. Now, while this was fun and like we went through and solved a complex problem, you're going to get stuck. And I got stuck and had to interject myself in the middle at certain points. So again, what you're trying to do to get yourself unstuck is add more context. And again, follow S to C, simple, specific, and use comments. Break up your problem into simpler problems, solving a specific task that are well commented. You can also try prompting again or in a different way. So rather than just trying to get a function back, you could have an inline comment of an existing function that you're trying to expand, adding new arguments or expanding it in a different way. And again, more comments, more top level comments, more inline comments, more comments throughout. Even in the middle of a dplyr pipeline, you can add a comment to have it do a mutate step to specifically add something in there. And then ultimately you're trying to build off your own momentum. As my script got longer and as I got closer to solving my problem, Copilot was actually doing a much better job with the context it was getting from my script. And ultimately, write some of your own code. You know, this is not gonna replace who you are as a programmer. It's gonna expand your skills or make you a bit faster. So solving a problem in an hour, as opposed to me just kind of searching around, trying to find examples, and then spending a whole day or two on it. So we talked a lot about Copilot, but I've got Edgar, Edgar Ruiz here, so I do wanna do a call out to say that there's more than one way to generate text. There's ghost text, which is really cool. It's Copilot, it's in our studio. But maybe I wanna chat with somebody. Maybe I wanna do chat GPT style. So Edgar has a package called Chatter through the MLverse group here at Posit. And you can actually run a OpenAI chat interface or other local um, models like Llama on your laptop and communicate with them through our studio in the viewer pane. So the Chatter app is what this basically is and it can allow you to connect to a lot of different models. Now, inside of our studio proper, number one, great logo, Chatter is awesome. You can call the Chatter Chatter app and you can pop it into our studio or you can run it as a background job to leave your console free so that you can interact with it. But in short, it'll just be in your little viewer pane and you can interact with it and ask more open-ended questions. But it's not even that basic. Like it really is essentially ChatGPT running inside of our studio in this example. But what Edgar has done here, and what they, what's really exciting, is the prompt is pre-populated with useful things. So if you look at this, and I don't want you to read it all because it's too much,
but there's like 20 lines of text in here of enriched information. So when you actually go to your prompt, it already has amazing amounts of context to help your responses be better for the task at hand, which is probably our programming. Although you can always customize this. We've uh, provided nice defaults, but you can customize it, modify it, and make it behave a bit more like you want it to. So ultimately, this is more of what you're doing with a chat style interface, is you're asking a question, but your question also has some enrichments that Chatter does, like saying, oh, there's files in the environment, there's data frame names in the environment, there's additional prompts that we're providing, and it has the history of the discussion so far. And this is submitted to the model, and you get a response back in the IDE, and happy, healthy, you can ask it questions, as well as get your co-pilot results in the IDE. So ultimately, this was a wild run through keyword and solving problems with Copilot in our studio, just showing you a few different ways of you can use them inside Workbench in our studio. Again, for the best outputs, at least with Copilot, you want to do these simple, specific use comments to be productive. Copilot is available as an optional integration. It's available as a preview feature in our upcoming 2023.09 release, release of our studio and Workbench. And if you want to provide feedback or report bugs about this feature, please open a GitHub issue on a repo, and we'll make improvements through that. Uh, for Chatter, you can install it from GitHub as well. So remotes, install GitHub, ML verse Chatter. And you can use it, again, with open AI um, endpoints, some other endpoints that are available via API interfaces, or open source models running on your local laptop, like Llama. So ultimately, whether you are a cat person, a dog person, or you like Totoro, there's a generative AI tool out there that you can use in our studio, be productive, and you can have your own little co-pilot that'll work with you. So thank you for your time, and I have some tons of questions. For you. C'était très intéressant. Oui, c'est la première. C'était la première fois qu'ils annoncent la l'intégration de GitHub Copilot, Copilot pardon, dans, dans Art Studio. N'hésitez pas à désactiver leur, euh, vos micros si vous voulez euh, vous intervenir. C'est bien possible. Euh, ça donne envie vraiment de, de l'essayer. <rire> ouais. Je me demande parce que c'est pas gratuit, hein, je pense. Non, c'est payant. C'est 10 dollars ouais. euh, par euh, mois. Par mois, oui. C'est gratuit pour les étudiants, les... Les professeurs, je pense, les chercheurs. Euh, non, je ne sais pas. Non, en fait, l'offre euh, petit, 10 dollars. Sinon, il y a l'offre business qui c'est 19. Oui, et oui. c'est possible d'avoir un abonnement mensuel ou annuel. Oui. Et après, la bonne chose, c'est qu'on on peut essayer avec la version gratuite. 30... Oui, c'est 30 jours. Oui, c'est possible. Comme ça, pour voir si, si vraiment ça oui. observe, c'est intéressant. Et 30 jours, c'est déjà bien pour comprendre si on veut dépenser 10, oui. <rire> 10 dollars par mois. Oui. Après, même si moi, je ne sais pas, ça peut aider, mais après moi, je sais quand je programme, ça, ça, ça améliore mes compétences en programmation. Peut-être pour les choses répétitives. C'est bien d'utiliser, mais après, euh, si on souhaite apprendre à maîtriser un nouveau package ou en hein, oui. sens, c'est bien de le programmer soi-même, je pense. Bah, après, là, je me demandais justement, euh, donc autant de chatter, si ça utilise ChatGPT, je suppose qu'il y a le bloc à, à 2021, mais au final, Copilot, en termes de, il sait faire les nouvelles fonctions ou pas forcément Ou il bloque aussi à 2021 ah, bonne question. Moi, je ne pense pas. Hein. Je pense les entraîner à faire, euh, bah, entraîner sur des données des fonctions euh, qui oui, sont en fait, Oui, il a été entraîné sur euh, 7 euh, billions of data. Okay. Oui, C'est ce que j'ai lu, en fait. Et, euh, mais ce qui est bien, c'est même ce, ce GitHub Copel, c'est possible d'utiliser aussi dans VS Code ou d'autres éditeurs. Ce n'est pas que RC. Ah, oui. Et puis sans internet, c'est vrai que ça peut être cool aussi. Ouais. Euh... D'accord. Euh... D'accord. 
Mais là, c'est question parmi les Français. Je ne sais pas. Non, je ne vois pas de questions. Moi, je préfère... Non, non, il n'y a pas de questions. Bon, s'il n'y a pas de questions, on peut passer au deuxième. Oui. C'est impressionnant et j'ai enfin, l'impression qu'il y a <rire> que c'est que le début et, et j'ai hâte de voir euh, l'avenir des codeurs <rire> dans ah, un oui. an. Est-ce que le métier va ouais, bouger ouais. ou... Tu les vois sur la chaise longue, <rire> les codeurs bah, Franchement, ce n'est pas si mal. Ça fait ça, hein <rire> oui, ça dépend, c'est après. <rire> Ah, ah, quelque chose pour acheter ton drink pour être sous la chaise. <rire> ah, enfin, je m'attendais pas à ce que ça bouge autant et, et aussi pratiquement. Oui. Bon, bah, <rire> D'accord, je vous propose de diffuser la deuxième présentation de euh, Deepcha sur euh, DataVis, sur le paquet sous le clé. Alors, là. Merci. So I'm Deepsha Meghani and today my goal is to be able to answer what is DataViz animation, interactivity and linking? How can you get started with it in your storytelling within Quarto itself? And finally have fun while we're learning that together. So there are lots of amazing packages already that you might have heard of, some I've listed, some I might have missed. But for the length of this talk, I'm going to focus on Plotly and Crosstalk. But know that each of those packages have unique strength for the need that you're trying to solve. But first, I want to talk about Ted Lasso. <laughs> Ted Lasso is a show on Apple TV, uh, and Apple is not paying me to tell you that. But there is an American football coach that is invited to teach UK Richmond soccer team, or as the rest of the world calls, real football. And in that, the captain is Roy Kent sitting on the right-hand side, who absolutely loves to say the word <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I'll try that again. He absolutely loves to say the word <laughs> Looks like their AI-powered bleeping is working really well. Great job, guys. So he loves to drop the F-bomb. When does he do it? Well when he's mad, definitely. But really, in every mode, if you've seen Ted Lasso, this is his natural mode. So we want to look at the number of times he drops F-bombs. Now, how do I know this? Because I watched the episodes at 2x speed and diligently noted them down, including the gestures for science. <laughs> so let's dig into the meat of it. Let's talk about animation. But first, I have a question for you. What season do you think Roy Kent ended up dropping the most number of F-bombs? And whether you've seen the show or not, I do have a hint for you. This is the first episode and how many F-bombs he drops in the very first episode of each season. So season one, two, and three, it's two, 11, and six. So if you think it's season one, raise your hand. Few. If you think it's season two with the highest count, well. And if you think it's season three, raise your hand. All right, let's find out. Ooh, let's see by the last quarter if season two is going to recover or season one going to recover. And season three, you all are winners. <laughs> so what was I able to do with the animation? I was able to hold the tension in the story while I was bringing you along. And I was able to add a third variable to my story, which is not usually visible in a 2D plot. The third variable here was element of time. It was a season versus count, that's all it was. And I added that element of time where you saw episode by episode. That's what it allowed me to do. Now let's come to the meat of it. How do you do it? This is where I'm gonna talk about Plotly package, where I'm just gonna talk about a very simple bar plot. I'm not gonna go into how do you prettify the bar plot because I just wanna talk about the basic code structure of animating something. So this is your simple bar plot. You've got a data set. From Plotly, you use the Plotly function, give it the x and y variable, and simply call add bars function. Looks kind of pretty similar to ggplot if, you, if you're used to that. All you need to do to this to make it animated is give it a frame component within your add bars. And what that frame equal to episode tells it is that don't just reveal my bar plot as it is, but build it frame by frame when I click on the play button. And that's all that's needed to animate your bar plot. 
You can also tell it how long to stay on a frame and how quick the transition to the next frame should be. That's it. Now that we've talked about animation, let's move on to interactivity. And this is where we're going to get a little bit technical because it might, we might bring up some statistic concepts, but I'll hold your hand through it. We're going to talk about F-score. And some of you stat nerds might already know this, but let's talk about it anyway. An episode's F-score is how many times Roy Kent drops the F-bomb divided by the total number of F-bombs in that episode. Or in other words, what's Roy Kent's contribution to that total episode's F-bombs? Now I have another question for you. Which season do you think has the highest number of episodes where Roy Kent's contribution was greater than 50% or his F score was greater than 50%? And I have another hint for you. So this is the total count that we saw from the previous animation plot. So which season do you think is the answer? Season one, two, three. Looks like you all are learning from the last <laughs> quiz. <laughs> so I'm just going to reveal the answer. No animation here. So this is how I could display the bar plot where every single episode, and there could be multiple more seasons, could be plotted in a single bar plot. And you could hover over it, look at the episode and the season that it's from, and look at the F-score count. Or I could just add a simple thing to make it easier to visualize, where let's just look at season one. So it has two episodes where the F-score is greater than 50%. Season three has got three episodes with greater than 50%. And season two, one, two, three, four episodes with greater than 50% F-score. So season two, this time you all are the winners. Now, what was I able to do through interactivity? I was able to turn my viz into a dashboard style report. And I know a lot of us have been asking, can that be a dashboard? So this is a great answer for that. And you were able to make your visualization more accessible by adding filtering. You could also add filters like scroll bars where you just see the F score within a certain range. Now, the meat of it, the code structure. I'm not going to dive again into the simple bar plot code structure, but a very quick recap of what that looks like. I am now going to introduce a package crosstalk. Now, crosstalk is exactly what the package name says. It allows you to talk between the checkbox and between the plot. So the first thing you do when you're using a crosstalk package is create a shared data object that would be shared between those two components. How do you do that? So we created the bar plot on a data set. Instead of doing that, we will create a shared data object from that data set using crosstalk's shared data function. Now, once you've created this shared data object, all you do is create the same bar plot that you had created. But instead of using data set, you just use this shared data object. Now, what's the other thing you need? You need a checkbox. So let's, Crosstalk has a filter checkbox function where you can create a checkbox component. You give it a unique ID. You give it a label, which is the heading you see. You give it the shared data saying that use this shared data object, not any data set. And then the grouping equal to season just tells it, okay, what am I highlighting? And you just place the checkbox and the plot side by side using the BS, BS calls function. And that's it. You have an interactive plot right within your Quarto presentation or Quarto HTML, any type of HTML like your website or document. Now let's talk about linking. It's another type of interactivity, and a lot of you might know of it as brushing. So I have another question, but we're not going to raise hands. Don't worry this time. Uh, at some point throughout the seasons, Roy Ken starts dating their PR manager, Kaylee, pictured here. And at some point, he starts coaching the team. So I wanted to find out whether when he was dating, did he mellow down and the average F score go down, maybe? Or when he was coaching, did it go up? Well. I'm sure Ted Lasso fans must have started guessing the answer here, but I'm going to reveal it right away. So here's the answer. So when he was only dating, the average F score was 43% through those episodes. When he was only coaching, it was 39%. But when he was dating and coaching, the average F score went up to 45%. Now, this is fine. I asked a question. I answered the question. Nothing wrong with it. But as Roy Kent said, don't you dare settle for fine. And I'm wearing that t-shirt as well because I'm channeling my Roy Kent energy. <laughs> so let's add additional insights to this by linking it to another plot. So on the left-hand side of the plot we just saw, 
And on the right hand side, I have the F count of every single episode and every single season. So let's say I wanted to see where he was dating, only what are those episodes? So I'm able to highlight that real quick. Now let's say I wanted to see the episodes where he was only coaching. I'm able to highlight that as well. But let's say I wanna know that when he was dating and coaching, what are the episodes that drove the F score to higher? The ambulance is one now. So you can hover over this, look at the episodes that are highlighted and see what were the F scores that were driving it up. Was it because Roy can dropped F-bomb too many times or was it because the episode's F count was just low in general? So you can drive more insights like this. Now, what was I able to do? I was able to add layers to the story that I had started with and I'm able to give my stakeholders more control to arrive at more insights than what they started with. Now the code, the structure of how do you create this linking? So again, we're gonna start with the crosstalk package to create a shared data object between the two plots. So you've got the shared data object created. The only difference this time is the key that says, okay, dating or coaching flag. So if I select on anything, any episode that has dating and coaching flag as yes, highlight all the episodes simultaneously. That's what this key tells you to do. Now you'll just create the simple plotly plot that we had talked about. So this first plot is where I'm plotting for the average S score through episodes. And the second plot where I'm just plotting the F count versus uh, each episode. And now you just place them side by side using the subplot command. That's it. You've got a linked plot, which one thing highlights and the other thing is highlighted by it. You can also give it how do you want the highlighting to work. So Plotly has this very neat function called highlight where you can say persistent equal to true means if I highlight something, keep the previous highlight on still. On and off just means if I double click, turn it off. If I click once, turn it on. And the dynamic equal to true means, did you see that color bar where I can click on the color and choose what color I wanna do highlighting with? That's your dynamic equal to true. Now that you have all of these amazing tools, the animation, interactivity, linking, Let's combine all of it in one plot. In other words, don't do that unless needed. So I'm gonna still show an example. So here, I wanted to animate F count and F scores side by side and see if the trend over seasons is similar. So I can add animation season over season. I also wanted to give the st stakeholders ability to click on a season and just dive into it. And I wanted to see, okay, if an episode has a high F count, does it mean they have a high F score, uh, et cetera. So there is so much happening here that it gets a bit chaotic when you use too many tools in one place. So if you were planning to make everything animated and interactive, stop. Try to think about how it moves your story forward and how you can use it better. And if you're using it in a, in a better way where it moves your story forward, right within Quarto, you're able to add tension to your story you're able to add a third variable to an otherwise 2D plot. You can turn some simple visualizations into a dashboard style and make it more accessible. You can add layers to your story and finally give your stakeholders more control by putting them in the driver's seat. Now, some of the resources I wanted to share was there's a GitHub repo for this presentation where you can look at the code I used to generate, but there's also a package where you can download the data of F counts dropped by Royken and the entire episode. So feel free to go nuts. And finally, I hope this makes you believe that you can easily get started with it. And that's it, thank you. I think it was also a second presentation. I don't know if you had the opportunity to use Plotly. Oui, non, c'était super, en fait, euh, la présentation aussi, parce que Crosstalk, c'est récemment que je suis venue à connaissance de cette package. Et en fait, euh, je, je vais l'essayer. Mm -hmm. En fait, c'est dans ma liste des mm -hmm. choses à faire, des packages, des R, des patrons. C'est des Crosstalk, parce qu'il a des potentialités et exceptionnel et à la fin si tu penses si tu, tu peux l'utiliser dans Quarto que tu fais ton report et après dans les mêmes documents sans faire des collages 
tu peux faire directement ta animation. Je pense que c'est un show super. Oui, moi aussi. Euh, moi, je crois. Mmh. Je disais, pour l'enseignement, vraiment, ça, ça ouvre des vraies perspectives de ne enfin, de pas passer de R à, à ton ordi. Enfin, vraiment, d'avoir tout sur une IA et d'être plus... Euh... Enfin, je sais pas, moi, ça me donne plein d'idées, donc c'est trop bien. Ah non, quoi que si tu l'as jamais utilisé, utilise-le. Moi, j'ai... J'ai fait une présentation et la chose super, c'est qu'il y a la chalkboard. Mm. Et ça, c'est super parce que pendant que tu fais ta présentation, après, tu as des questions et, et surtout quand tu es en ligne et tu n'es pas dans... que tu as quelque chose pour écrire, c'est super. Tu peux directement, tu es en ligne et tu peux expliquer les choses. Moi, j'utilise ma tablette graphique avec mm. Quarto. Et comme ça, je peux écrire, je peux souligner des choses. Non, non, il y a des potentialités énormes, quoi. Énormes. Ah oui, c'est une occasion de créer des présentations, c'est ça, avec Quarto Oui, oui, oui. Moi, maintenant, je l'ai fait avec Quarto, mes présentations. Okay. Quand je l'ai découverte, vraiment, je vous le conseille, parce qu'il y a beaucoup de potentialités. Au début, ça semble un peu... Oh, c'est compliqué. Bon, j'ai toujours utilisé ça, c'est facile. Mmh. Mais après, il y a vraiment de perdre un peu de temps pour l'apprendre. Mais après, les potentialités sont énormes. Qu'il est temps. Après, tu sais, tu vas faire tes présentations à moins de temps qu'avec les, les autres euh, outils. Oui. oui. Ouais, c'est bien. Moi, pour la, la création des, des graphiques interactifs, je n'ai pas eu l'occasion d'utiliser ça. Voilà, mais j'ai pardon. Mais je n'ai pas eu l'occasion d'utiliser euh, Plotly, mais c'était plutôt j'utilisais JGRAP. Je ne sais pas si vous le connaissez. Ah oui, oui. Euh, je, je, de, qui crée euh... des, des, des graphiques interactifs, en fait. Et c'est dans oui. c'est un graphique JGPlot2. Et tu, après, tu rajoutes des girafes et ça fait un graphe interactif. C'est mmh. intéressant. Okay. Ouais. Oui. <coughs> J'ai vu la présentation de David Goel pendant oui. les rencontres R. Il a parlé de ça, des girafes. Oui, c'était très intéressant. Oui, ouais, c'était lui le créateur. Je ne sais pas, chers participants, si vous avez des, des questions, si vous voulez faire des interventions, n'hésitez pas. Vous voulez partager votre expérience avec Quart ou si vous l'avez déjà utilisé, ouais, si quelqu'un l'a déjà utilisé. Mais... Est-ce que vous avez l'habitude de créer, de faire de la data vise ou pas Je ne sais pas. <rire> ouais, J'ai une petite question, euh, Mouna. Oui. Euh, Est-ce que tu sais si on a accès à d'autres présentations de la Posite Conf Ah, c'est pas encore euh, disponible. Ah, c'est pas encore. Euh, D'accord. Oh. C'est juste nous qui, qui, ont, qui souhaitaient préfère le cette watch party, ils ont donné l'accès en fait, c'est pour ça. Et à, normalement, ça sera diffusé après sur la chaîne YouTube de Posit. Toute la conférence Je ne sais pas, peut-être qu'on sélectionne, je ne sais pas, je ne vais pas te dire des bêtises, je ne sais pas. Mais certainement les workshops, non. Déjà, nous, on n'a pas les, les replays des workshops, on a juste les conférences, les, les Lightning Talks. Euh... C'est juste ça. Tu as une présentation spécifique que tu souhaites regarder Non, mais c'est juste, c'est super intéressant. Quoi. Il y a plein de packages qu'on découvre. Ça donne plein d'idées. Même la façon de présenter, je trouve que c'était super fun. Ah ouais, j'ai adoré. <rire> Et ça te donne des idées pour la suite. Donc... <rire> oui, c'est différent. Non, non, c'était impressionnant. Euh, D'accord. Ouais, elle faisait des blagues et tout. Ouais, <rire> tellement à l'aise. Ouais. C'est ouais. ouais. Ok, très bien. Euh, je pense qu'on peut clôturer notre meet-up. Ah oui, s'il n'y a pas des questions et tout, oui, je pense que je suis d'accord. Ah si, j'ai une dernière question. Ah oui. Euh, il, est, il était comment, Adley Wickham <rire> <rire> Moi, je n'ai pas cru mes yeux quand je l'ai rencontré. <rire> il était sympa, il était tellement modeste. Non, non, il était sympa. Il faisait, c'était lui qui faisait à chaque fois la présentation durant les journées de conférence. Au, au début, en fait, avant. <coughs> Mais lui, il était sympa. Ouais, ouais, ça marche. Merci beaucoup de, de, de votre participation. Et, euh, merci à toi. Ouais. Ouais, merci. merci à tout le monde.
Et n'hésitez pas à être présent à notre prochain Meetup qui sera organisé à Datacraft à Paris. Nous allons bientôt diffuser les Meetup sur notre groupe Meetup. <rire> le 19 octobre. Oui, à partir du 19 octobre. Euh, merci encore une fois et bonne soirée. Merci à vous. Merci beaucoup. Bonne soirée. Bonne soirée. Salut. Salut.